Welcome everyone. We'll just give folks a couple more minutes to log into Zoom. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. Um, before I start um, introductions, I just wanted to let everyone know, um, especially if you haven't been to one of our programs before, um, if you have any questions um, for our presenter Jane tonight, please feel free to put them either in the chat or in the Q&A section down at the bottom Zoom menu of your screen. Um, and then we'll be able to get back to them later on in the presentation. Um, and then make sure we take care of all of those. And so what I will do first is just to say again, thank you so much for coming tonight and joining us for Art on Thursdays. We are presenting Revolutionary Design, Modern Architecture in New England. Um, New England is known for its history and its traditions, but it is also home to some daring and inventive modern designs from some of the world's leading architects. How do giants in the field like Frank Lloyd Wright, Walter Gropius, Louis Kahn, Philip Johnson, and Maya Lin combine the expected and the familiar in the innovative and experimental? This program introduces audiences to each architect and walks you through their notable works in New England locals, locales. Jane O'Neill, our presenter tonight, is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. She curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, she has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Currier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And for more information, please visit IamCulturallyCurious.com. I'll be sure to, putting that in, to put that into the chat just so that everyone can reference it later on if they'd like to. And also keep an eye out in the chat. Um, I might post some of um, the next couple of months programs just if anyone's interested in knowing those. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Jane. Thank you, Gianna, and thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about modern architecture in New England. As always, we're in for a treat. This is one of my favorite topics. It's near and dear to me. So tonight we will be zooming through five different properties, three different New England states. Um, three of the properties that we'll look at are houses where that you can uh, tour today. They are open to the public. And two of them are on academic campuses with varying degrees of, of public accessibility. So I might recommend getting in touch with the institution before you try to walk through the doors. So I'm going to save you some time and gas because we, we're going to visit them virtually today. But that being said, I hope this inspires um, a road trip or two this summer. So um, a, a very quick preamble. Typically when we're thinking about um, the words revolution and New England, we're thinking about things that happened in the 18th century. We don't often think of New England as being a hotbed of architectural innovation. Most of our celebrated architecture in New England are, are examples of early architecture, like um, John Adams birthplace over here on the left, which is a nice old salt box colonial, or a federal style mansion that we see over here on the right that is on the property of Strawberry Bank in Portsmouth. This is the Governor Goodwin Mansion. So these are the kinds of things that we see being preserved. These are the kinds of things that we see being celebrated. But tonight we're going to see things that are very different, but oftentimes touch on these New England traditions, give nice little nods to them. So let me show you how we're going to move through this next hour. We're going to get started 
with the Gropius House, uh, a little bit of Bauhaus simplicity. We'll turn our attention to Frank Lloyd Wright's house, uh, the Zimmerman House in Manchester, New Hampshire, and then turn our attention to the Glass House designed by Philip Johnson in New Canaan, Connecticut. And then uh, our last two properties, like I said, are, are libraries on academic campuses. So we'll look at Louis Kahn's library at Phillips Exeter Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire, and Maya Lynn's recently opened library, Nielsen Library at Smith College in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. Okay, so much to cover. Uh, let's get started. Oh, I should quickly mention too, this beautiful little passage right here. This is just a... Uh, a little, uh, a, a little sort of melody inside the house of the, the Zimmerman house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Most people walk past it. This is um, glass coals from Glorning, uh, Corning Glassware, and they are illuminated behind this brick wall with uh, very hard to reach electric light bulbs. So it's just like a little modern stained glass ar uh, arrangement here. It's delightful. Okay, so let's get started with Walter Gropius. We can see him here in two photographs from sort of the bookends of his career. He was a German-American architect and really a pioneer of modern architecture. He was um, uh, introducing, essentially, uh, America to uh, uh, its probably most uh, uh, important style for the 20th century. Now, architecture was sort of in his blood. He managed to survive the First World War in Germany, and then he followed in his father's footsteps and sort of hung out his shingle as an architect. And just as important in terms of his legacy as being an architect, he was also a teacher. So he was the founder of a school called the Bauhaus, and he designed this building here on its campus. And you might look at a building like this and sort of think, you know, so what? <laughs> it looks like a warehouse. It looks like so many buildings in um, in industrial parks in every city in America. And there's a reason for that. This was a very innovative design uh, back when, when Gropius designed it in uh, the mid-1920s. The Bauhaus uh, uh, school sort of introduces what's known as the international style, which sort of strips... Um, uh, buildings of any sort of decoration or ornamentation. It relies heavily on mass-produced um, materials, and it also strips these buildings of color. So we see a reliance on uh, black, white, gray, and a, a big reliance on glass as well. And so we've become really accustomed to seeing these buildings. They're economical to build, and they were dominant really up until the 1970s. Now, Adolf Hitler hated all things modern. And so when he came into power in the 1930s, he closed the Bauhaus school and Walter Gropius and many others sort of fled the country for their lives. So Walter Gropius ends up in the United States. He's got a job teaching at um, the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And Helen Storrow, a, a big benefactor of the arts, donates some land to, in Lincoln, Massachusetts to Walter Gropius so that he can build a house in, in his preferred style here in America. So we are looking right now at the facade of the Gropius house built in 1938. It's three beds, three baths, and it's about 2,300 square, square feet. I love looking at historic architecture because it's so personal. You get a real sense of like, how how would I feel living in a space like this? Do, is it designed for, um, in a way that can be really useful? So I will say, just to get us sort of oriented in space and time, this is um, a structure that is about a mile away from Walden Pond and about 15 miles away from Harvard Square as the crow flies. <clears throat> But really not since uh, shots rang out in nearby Concord, Massachusetts, had anything so revolutionary happened in the greater Boston area. Um, here is just a slightly different view of the house, and we'll sort of start talking about what we see going on here. Um, Gropius designed this house for him and his family, and it was... Uh, it, it includes some nods to, to local architecture. If you have really good eyes, you can probably just see that there is some clapboard on this house, but it's oriented vertically. There's also a fieldstone foundation. There's a brick chimney that you can't actually see in, in this photograph. And there's even a porch out front. It's not like any other porch in New England, really. But all of these things are little nods to tradition. Everything else is 
Bauhaus innovation here. So it's basically um, this block that we're looking at here with these ribbons of windows. I love in particular how this ribbon of windows uh, terminates with this spiral staircase. So you can actually almost imagine it like a, a ribbon coming out into three dimensions. Then we have this projecting porch, this porch that comes off of the house at an angle towards us. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit more. Actually, let's move towards that porch right now. But I should mention before we move away from this image that this house did not fit in with the neighborhood at all. And you can imagine that neighbors didn't really want to look at something that didn't fit into sort of the quaint New England traditions. So um, so I guess a lot of neighbors kind of referred to it as a chicken coop and believed that the, that the roof would collapse after the first snowstorm of obviously the house still stands. So imagine you're Gropius or imagine you move into this house after Gropius and you drive up your driveway at the end of the day and this porch is almost reaching out towards you. It almost feels like it's running out towards the driveway to give you some sense of shelter here. There is of course that spiral staircase but that's a little bit further away. So you'd go to the porch first and as you're approaching the door there are these um, glass bricks here that offer a sense of protection even before you get to that front door. Now, once you step inside the Gropius house, you begin to see just how kind of wonderfully functional this house is. And I should mention, shortly after it was built, it was featured in the New York Times. And so in the first few years that it stood, thousands of people went to visit the Gropiuses to experience this, this innovative house that they designed. One woman apparently said to Mrs. Gropius something to the effect of, isn't it exhausting to always live ahead of your time? But for the Gropiuses, this was a house that worked very well for them. So just to get you oriented here, over here in the image on the left, we are looking into the entryway. This right here is the handle to the front door. So you'd walk in this door and you're in this light filled space. There's the continuation of those glass bricks there. But the, it's also a space that can be easily enclosed. We notice that the white and black from the exterior of the house continues to these curtains here. The, the curtain rod is built into the ceiling and you can close off this space, add a little bit of, a, of an extra sense of protection from the elements as people are coming into your house. Another detail that I love here is that the carpet is actually built into the floor too. So nobody's gonna trip over it and people will stop to, to use it. Now, um, you'll notice that there is an open coat closet right along uh, sort of behind the door in some ways with just general uh, metal tubing here, all exposed. Uh, and, and part of the Bauhaus philosophy, it was to use industrial materials, to use things that were cheap and, and, and readily available. So they do that to great effect here. You can also notice these sconces. The sconces on the wall were, were the sorts of things that would have been used in commercial settings, really, but uh, Gropius integrated them into a, a residential setting here. We, we notice that there's more vertical clapboard siding that he's brought into the house as well. And then as we sort of step away from that front door, we can see the staircase leading up. Now, this winding staircase is a little bit of a nod to New England traditions, but that's sort of where the nod ends. <laughs> we notice that there's a sense of protection um, because there's more of this metal tubing that creates uh, a, a additional handrail. But this black handrail that sort of snakes up the, the staircase on the right is one of the only custom elements created for this house. And the form of it is just really unusual, really charming. So before you head upstairs, I want to invite you into the Gropius's dining room because I think that this is such a wonderfully intimate space. So it's a small space. As you can see, there's more of this glass brick over here. So you get this kind of wonderful ambient lighting if you're there for a dinner party. And then on the other side of the room, there's this huge plate glass window. So as the sun's setting, you have this kind of unobstructed view of the back garden and unobstructed view of nature. So you almost feel like you're dining outside, but you are protected. The furniture here was wildly innovative for the time. These were Bauhaus uh, prototypes that they brought with them from Germany. They were designed by the furniture designer, Marcel Breuer. 
who designed a lot of the furniture in this house, including things like the tables that you see over here and a lot of the living room furniture too. Now in this dining room, there's a little pinhole light in, in the ceiling that creates this cone of light over the table, creating this incredible sense of intimacy while you sit there. Uh, you're really focused on the people that you're dining with. To add to that sense of intimacy, Gropius also added these curtains here. So you could really kind of close up this space and you would feel like you were in a small intimate dining experience. Now we're going to move just beyond those curtains into the living room. We can see the fireplace here. We're going to focus on this window and the furniture around it over here. So basically two views of the same space. And in this one photograph over here on the left, you can see that the sunlight is just pouring in here. Gropius specifically designed this house to take advantage of passive solar energy. So on, on you know, in a, on a cold winter day when the sun is low in the sky, it's flooding that room. On a hot summer day when the sun is high in the sky, the room stays shady and protected. Now you might be wondering why do they have Ikea furniture in, in this historic house from 1938? <clears throat> it's because this was another Bauhaus uh, Bauhaus uh, uh, prototype, also designed by Marcel Breuer. So this um, experiment here with laminated uh, uh, plywood furniture really came from Germany in the 1920s. And it was Walter Gropius that, that helps to introduce it to American audiences. Doesn't it just look like such a cozy place to, to sit down and read a book? Now, notice these bookshelves here. They are not you know, a big wooden bookshelves that take up a lot of space on the floor. Instead, these are bookshelf fixings that you would add to the wall. Normally, this sort of thing was used in commercial settings or in retail settings. Uh, Walter Gropius didn't design these kinds of bookshelves, but he was probably one of the first people who used it in a residential setting. And of course, it saves a lot of space on the ground and creates a lot of space for your books. So he's innovative all along the way. We're going to head upstairs now to the primary bedroom. This is where Walter Gropius and his wife slept. And it's a really strange bedroom. And one of the, the first things that you'll notice as you step into this bedroom is that it is divided down the middle with the bed on one side and sort of a dressing area on the other side. Uh, that wall is cut uh, through so that there's a big piece of plexiglass you can see right through this wall, except for where we see that there is a mirror. So there's this interesting sort of uh, transparent barrier in the middle of this primary bedroom. Um, if you sort of sneak through here back behind the dressing table, you have access to the, the Gropius's master bathroom as well. So why would you do something like this? Well, there's a simple reason, and it's so smart. The Gropiuses liked to sleep with their windows open for a majority of the year. This was a way to control the temperature inside of the house. It's, it's, um, it's really smart. They were doing that essentially in every room. So you could close the door right here, have this chilly bedroom, and then be able to you know run to a nice warm bathroom in the middle of the night if you so needed to. Now, the Gropius has had an adopted 12-year-old daughter, and they were very concerned with creating a space for her, a bedroom for her, that would really suit her needs and, and sort of meet her dreams, too. At the time, she had all sort of, sorts of like outlandish dreams. She wanted a floor of sand, and she wanted to be able to see the stars when she went to bed at night. And they found good ways to try and meet her in the middle. First of all, they gave her the biggest bedroom and sort of where we're, we're looking, where we're standing in this room, um, her bed is sort of behind us. But as you go around this corner where we can see that there's another built-in curtain here and a little dressing area, we see it over here in this photograph, there's a little reading nook here. So you have almost like your own clubhouse within your room as um, if you're Gropius's 12-year-old daughter. Now, he couldn't give her the stars to look at as she went to bed, but he did give her this door to her own private patio here, her own terrace. Um, this is Mrs. Gropius lounging in that terrace. Here's a, a present day photograph. And this wall here was actually painted pink by the Gropiuses to kind of um, reduce some of the glare. But this was just above that living room. So you get all of that great uh, summer sunlight in a terrace like this. 
You'll notice here is the opening to that door where the spiral staircase was on the front of the house. So he gave his daughter a great deal of freedom to move around the space here. So let's think a little bit about the, the kind of enduring legacy of the Gropius house. Now, first of all, uh, Helen Storrow also gave uh, about uh, four acres of land to that furniture designer, Marcel Breuer, who ended up building his Bauhaus inspired uh, 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 home next door to the Gropiuses. And from there, you can see that modern architecture sort of proliferates in Lincoln, Massachusetts, so much so that there is still a Friends of Modern Architecture group in Lincoln, and uh, and I believe that they still hold tours and other kinds of events. So you can look them up online, the Friends of Modern Architecture in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Uh, the Gropius House is a national landmark, and you can visit it through uh, historic New England seasonally. It is a place worth visiting. The um, the functionality of this house, I think, is just really, really exciting. But all of the little innovations around uh, 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 throughout every room, I think, are just they just sort of dazzle you. <laughs> they're still really innovative, and they're about a hundred years old at this point. So let's turn our attention to our next architect here. This is Philip Johnson. We have his dates up above as well. Now, the New York Times characterized Philip Johnson in his obituary as the elder statesman and the enfant terrible of modern architecture. He was born in Cleveland and he studied uh, at Harvard University, actually under Gropius. So we've got a direct connection between our first two architects here. And after he graduated, uh, within like five years of graduating, he traveled around and he published this, um, this, this book on the international style of architecture, which really helped put him, Philip Johnson, on the map. Now, uh, much of his work as an architect was... Uh, was was a way to kind of advocate, advocate for more of the aesthetic side of architecture. That's what he was really concerned with, as opposed to the functional side of architecture. He won the um, the AIA, the uh, American Institute of Architects, gold medal in 1978. That's the highest uh, award given to an architect. I should mention that Walter Gropius was also bestowed that honor as well. Now we have a close connection to Philip. Johnson in the greater Boston area and others of libraries because he was the architect who designed the addition to the Boston Public Library's main branch in Copley Square. This is the original McKim building di uh, designed at the end of the 19th century. And this is the addition that Philip Johnson created in 1972, sort of this massive fortress. Um, but it's, it's an interesting sort of companion to the McKim building in terms of its scale and its color and that sort of thing. I love this image over here on the right because we also get I.M. Pei's uh, Hancock Tower in the background and I.M. Pei and Philip Johnson went to architecture school together. So this is all just like one close little family of architects as, we're, as uh, we go through tonight's program. Now we are going to be focusing on Philip Johnson's uh, world famous, very innovative glass house that was designed in 1949. And as I mentioned, it's in New Canaan, Connecticut. This was a house that he designed for himself. And I should mention that Philip Johnson called himself his own best client. <laughs> so the glass house starts what becomes this sprawling uh, complex of buildings. Uh, typically little buildings, uh, experimental buildings for Philip Johnson. Uh, by the time he died, the the complex was like 49 acres and there was something like 14 different buildings on them, but it was the glass house that kind of started it all. So, um, and it really helps to to launch his career in many ways. Let's, let's approach it. Let's get a little bit closer. <clears throat> and you might be thinking, okay, what you see is what you get here. You're not far off. Now, Philip Johnson is quoted as saying that his idea for the glass house came from his experience of seeing this burnt wooded wooden wooden village when he was touring um, Europe during World War II. He said that nothing was left of these of these uh, little uh, uh, houses except the foundations and the chimneys, and that's really what you see happening here too. 
there's an architectural historian that said it a little bit more poetically. He said that these are farm, this is like a inspired by a farmhouse that was purified by water, purified by fire, I'm sorry, during the war. It's reducing a house down to its essence. So what we're looking at here is a steel frame structure and all of its walls are made out of glass. The structure is about 1,800 square feet, and it includes a kitchen, a dining room, a living room, a bedroom, a study, and a bathroom. So I want to show you um, all of these spaces, but of course, they are all in just one big enclosed glass space. So here is the living room space. Um, and really, what makes this house spectacular? The reason we're still talking about it today is because of the way it creates this interesting relationship between architecture and the landscape. Uh, Philip Johnson was quoted as saying, I have very expensive wallpaper. <laughs> it's all about framing up these views. And, and really, here's a slightly more intimate look at, at the, the, the living room space here. It is about making this house feel integrated into the landscape uh, creating this duality that you're inside and outside at the same time that you are apart from and yet a part of the landscape that surrounds the house. So this is a house that aims at becoming invisible. Now, this furniture here, I should mention the furniture because it's designed by another architect named Mies van der Rohe. And, and in some ways, Philip Johnson had sort of trumped Mies van der Rohe with the whole idea of a glass house. Um, if In your leisure time, you can look up Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth house, which is essentially the same idea as the glass house, but Philip Johnson finished his uh, first. But we still have the same sort of streamlined furniture that, um, that somebody like Walter Gropius would have appreciated, right? So let's turn our attention to the dining room just uh, behind the living room over here. We have um, just a simple streamlined table, again, this sort of international style of furniture. And one of the things that I like thinking about in terms of the dining room at the glass house, I don't know if you feel this way in your own dining rooms, but I have my favorite chair and it's sort of positioned at my own dining room table, I should mention. And it's sort of positioned in such a way that... Um, uh, you can see all the doors. Nobody can sort of sneak up behind you. There's this sense of safety and also you get a, the best view, you know? And in this space, I think you could really enjoy and feel that sort of same sort of sense of protection and safety from any one of these chairs. And I think that there would be such a pleasure in kind of rotating through them, appreciating the different views at different times of the day. So next we move on to our kitchen in the glass house and it is a very simple kitchen. It's really just an L-shaped counter and integrated into that counter, counter we can see a very small sink and a very small stove. And uh, Philip Johnson so desired a clean, streamlined aesthetic inside the glass house that he made it so that you could fold over the countertops to eliminate the visual clutter of the sink and um, the other utilitarian spaces here. So please imagine not having anything on your countertops if you want to live in a glass house like this. Now, I also want to show you the living room from a slightly different perspective here, where you can see how this fireplace really dominates the space. It's a little bit funny to me because, um, you know, gathering around the fireplace is a little bit of like a quaint 19th century notion of family life and, and American architecture, but it, it, it's also a romantic notion. So he integrates it into the design here, but that cylindrical um, uh, brick edifice in the, in, in the glass house also has another really important function because you walk alongside the back of it and that is where your bathroom is. And of course, for your bathroom, or at least in some space inside this house, you want to be able to shower, strip naked, do all of these functional things with your body in a way that nobody else can see. <laughs> the glass is great and all until you need to take a shower. So we see this uh, very small, simple, beautiful, elegant, understated bathroom here. 
And then where do you sleep in the glass house? It's just um, behind this kind of bank of closets here. There's the fireplace bathroom, a very simple bed. The study is over here. You've got this uh, um, sort of unencumbered view of this beautiful landscape. Now imagine waking up every morning to the sunlight like this. Maybe you would love it. Maybe you would hate the idea that, you know, somebody walking by might be able to see you. Now, Philip Johnson began to kind of worry about his own guests. Where would you put your guests if you lived in a house like this? So Philip Johnson comes up with the idea of the guest house for the glass house. And the guest house, which is just slightly diagonal from the edge of the, um, of the glass house, is its exact opposite. It is all about security and privacy from the glass house. It looks like it is a solid brick structure with no windows. There are in fact, some windows in the guest house. Here is the glass house. You can see that some shades had been added at some point, but here's the guest house. And um, there are some round windows here that face away from the glass house. So if you're a guest of Philip Johnson, you can look outside, but you certainly can't look at him after you leave um, his house. And here's just a quick view inside of what it's like to, to be inside the guest house at um, Philip Johnson's property. Now, another conundrum you have if you own a glass house is what do you do with your artwork? Philip Johnson and his partner, David Whitney, were, um, were, were, were uh, very devoted to the arts and they had an extensive collection of art. So uh, Philip Johnson designs an underground art gallery to house all of their art. And here is the entrance to that gallery. This is all still on the same property here. Uh, this was built in 1965. It's a little bit like an underground bunker, right? You feel like you're going into some sort of uh, like a prehistoric treasury or something like that, a citadel. Now, the plan here is you walk down a little corridor and then you come into this space that is actually four kind of overlapping, well, four, four circles that, that come together. And in, um, in the ceiling are these movable walls. So you can move the walls and not the paintings. It's sort of, you can sort of flip through them almost as though you're shopping for, for posters at the mall <laughs> when you're a teenager. And you can um, you can decide what you want to look at, at at on a given day. So these are very big carpeted walls, and and it gives you the opportunity to to showcase a, a great art collection. Now I want to leave you uh, with one last building that Philip Johnson designed on this property. He called it Da Monsta from 1995. This is a building that's made out of modified gunite. It's very small in terms of its proportions. Many of the buildings that he designed on the property were um, considered like follies, sort of like little experiments. This is a building that's probably inspired by an architect like um, Frank Gehry with all of these kind of curving forms. Frank Gehry's buildings, when you go inside, turn into rational spaces. For, <laughs> for Philip Johnson, he created this, this, this space, and you can only just get a sense of it with the photograph here, but the, the corners um, and the ceiling and the floor, they meet at strange angles. It's a very disorienting space to walk through. Now, um, Philip Johnson knew that the, his entire property was going to be uh, donated, I think it's to the National Trust, and that it was going to be made public. So he actually imagined that this structure here would be like the visitor center to his property, but it makes you physically ill to go, to go inside of it. So the visitor center uh, was uh, located instead across from the train station in downtown New Canaan. So um, easy, easily accessed, and then they take you on a bus ride to the property. So we'll end our look at the glass house with two photographs here of who else but Andy Warhol. <laughs> here is uh, Philip Johnson sitting at the table, and here's Andy Warhol in another picture with like a little party happening at the glass house. So Andy Warhol provides us the opportunity right now to sort of think of the glass house in, in sort of zoom out, think of it in, in big picture terms. Now, I'll mention that um, Philip Johnson had security issues when he lived there. He didn't live there 24-7 his entire life. But when he did stay there, there were always people who were trying to get onto his property, to peer into his house, because there is this fascination in terms of watching how somebody else lives, sort of breaking down 
that veneer of privacy that we have when we go into our homes. So there's something about living in a glass house that's very similar to being on a reality TV show or showing your life to everybody you know through social media. And no wonder Andy Warhol was fascinated by it, right? It's almost like a glass house was like stepping into a television set. So um, so it makes you more interesting just by being there. Now, the glass house, uh, it, when David, uh, when Philip Johnson stops living there all the time, becomes a place where uh, where he could kind of hold these salons for artists and architects and, and people were always coming and going. He used it as a place to entertain. But I think it is really a place that prompts us to consider the most fundamental questions about architecture and how we live. I, I don't think any one of us is really clamoring to live in a glass house, but there's a lot of really interesting ideas there. Now, the last house that we're going to look at today is designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, a man who almost needs no introduction. He's actually the oldest out of all of our architects. He was born, you know, just after the Civil War, and um, he has been called America's most famous architects. Now, he was a designer of buildings, of furniture, of landscapes. He wrote books, he taught architecture, and on occasion, he would even design the clothes that he intended his clients to wear in the houses that he designed for them. So uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is no doubt best known for his, his home, uh, the home that he designed, I should say, called Falling Water. And this was designed in 1935. It's in southwestern Pennsylvania. And it's a house that sort of looks like these modern cantilevered uh, terraces are springing out of this rocky outcropping. And of course, all of it is sitting on top of this waterfall. It is majestic. It's heroic. It calls out to us with this wonderful combination of modern materials and a nod to the natural world as well. Um, this was a house designed for a very rich man. Now, uh, it was also designed during the Depression, and that's when Frank Lloyd Wright had to get really innovative because there weren't a lot of rich men <laughs> who were clamoring to have uh, innovative houses built for them. So the year after he designed Falling Water, he uh, came up with a new house type that he called Usonian. To Frank Lloyd Wright, the word Usonian was essentially a synonym for American but it also has these associations in our heads like utopian or utilitarian and all of these things kind of come together in a house that he thought of as being for the middle class these are modest houses that really still embody so much of his um, architectural philosophy so this is the jacobs house the first usonian house this is in madison wisconsin when you get your usonian house you get a house that is protected from um, from the road, but provides like a, a lot of opportunity to connect with the outdoors in your backyard. You also get all of your furniture designed by Frank Lloyd Wright too. And the first Usonian house was something like, uh, I think about $6,000 total back in the 1930s. After World War II, Frank Lloyd Wright was still designing Usonian houses, but they um, they get a little bit more refined and they also get a little bit more expensive. So we are looking at Manchester, New Hampshire's uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman house here. This is a very hard house to photograph because as you can see here, it is a very long, low house. So some of the images that I'll be showing are, you are sort of like a, a bent in a certain way, just to try and fit in as much as possible. Now, this house was designed um, just a year after Philip Johnson's glass house, and it was completed in 1952. Uh, it's two beds, two baths, and about 1,800 square feet. So the same square footage as the glass house. When all was said and done, this house cost the clients $60,000 so in today's money, that would be more than half a million dollars. Wright designed this house for a professional middle-aged couple. Uh, he never actually came to New Hampshire to oversee the building, to experience it himself, or even to get a sense of, of the, the property, although he, um, he very clearly studied the site map. 
Now, the Zimmermans, who were just devoted fans of Frank Lloyd Wright, kept inviting him up, especially Mrs. Zimmerman. And he wrote her a letter and he said, oh, Mrs. Zimmerman, I know your house from A to Z, which is a nice little play on her last name. Now, suffice it to say, nobody had ever seen a house like this in the mill town of Manchester, New Hampshire. And interestingly, the neighbors called this house a chicken coop too. That I guess that's just a, a go-to way to denigrate any sort of uh, architecture that doesn't seem familiar. Now, I will say I've been to literally dozens of Frank Lloyd Wright design properties all over the country. And this house here in New England that is open to the public is by far the best preserved Frank Lloyd Wright house I've ever been to. So if you've never been, go online and buy your tickets right now. You can get them through the Courier Museum of Art. Their website is courier.org. So let me introduce you. Uh, let's get a little bit more uh, better acquainted with the Zimmerman house. So looking at it from above, you can see it's on a roughly rectangular plot here. And Wright does something unusual. He cites the house diagonally on the plot. Most of us would probably just prefer for our house to, to face the street, much like the house next door. But what he's doing here is he is maximizing the privacy on one side and the privacy in terms of exposure to the road and the privacy in terms of outdoor living on the other side. He's also maximizing passive solar energy too. We'll get, we'll get into that in just a moment. So as we approach the house, imagine you are the Zimmermans coming up to your house at the end of the day. Um, you don't have a garage, you have a carport over here. And you might be thinking, wow, for roughly half a million dollars, the equivalent of half a million dollars, no garage. Frank Lloyd Wright loved cars, but he hated the idea of a garage. He, he thought cars are not horses and they don't need stables. So you don't need to design a, a garage for them. And when you think about it, why would you want to drive into a garage at the end of the day? What's in your garage? It's, it's stuff, it's chaos, right? When you drive into the Zimmerman's house carport, there is this little cut through so that you can see into the backyard and you have this pristine view, the cinematic view of nature framed up for you. And you get out of your car and you're all of a sudden breathing deeply, enjoying this view, which I have to tell you, is gorgeous on every single day of the year. Like if it's raining, if it's snowing, this view, this little peek into their backyard sort of sets the stage for relaxation in this wonderful way. Um, now, as you move towards the front door here, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright sort of famously hid his front doors. He made them hard to find to add to that sense of privacy. We can see that it's not too hard to find, but um, but we do see that th that there is this um, emphatic sense of privacy on the front facade of the house. There is um, these concrete, the stamped concrete block windows with tiny panes of glass in them. You don't have any sense of what's behind this brick wall here. The front door is kind of marked by this granite boulder. As I mentioned, Wright had seen the the uh, the landscape design for the house, and he wanted the house to um, to have this relationship to the natural setting there, not on the same scale as falling water by any stretch of the imagination, but he's still uh, continuing that that same idea. So when you head inside the Zimmerman house, I'm going to bring you into their living room. This is what Frank Lloyd Wright called the garden room. And there's great reason for this. We'll, we'll be turning our attention to the garden in just a moment. Um, this room is a, a, a great embodiment of Frank Lloyd Wright's philosophy of organic architecture. Organic architecture encompassed a lot of different ideas. First of all, we've got an autumnal color palette, a world away from the white and the black of the Bauhaus, right? Um, everything looks like it could be a crisp fall day from the color of the brick to the color of the textiles. You've got these warm woods, and just the fact that we see these natural materials, that nothing's painted, that these beautiful materials can sort of shine on their own. Every brick is kind of perfectly milled here. Um, that is another embodiment of organic architecture. Organic architecture is also supposed to feel like, like the house is set kind of rooted to the ground and growing organically. And Wright does that in, in a number of very smart ways throughout the house. You can just barely glimpse it here, but the floor is poured concrete. And in this poured concrete floor, he has scored a grid 
a four foot by four foot grid. So there's these squares, uh, these squares that sort of define the space of the house. And then you begin to see them throughout the house. So for example, these very tall, um, sort of uncomfortable looking cushions on the back of this very long bench are roughly four feet by four feet. Just above them, an extension of that, those stamped concrete block windows are roughly two feet by two feet. And then the pane of glass inside of them is roughly one foot by one foot. So this is like an organic relationship between the various parts of the house. And you begin to see these relationships everywhere. So when you're sitting on this very long bench and apparently Mrs. Zimmerman liked to come home at the end of the day and just lie down on the bench, look up at that beautiful wooden ceiling. But when you're sitting here, what you're looking at at this wall over here are these brick piers uh, that uh, hold a, like a wooden frame of glass so that really Frank Lloyd Wright is framing up these views of nature in the backyard and he is creating a seamless transition from inside to outside by having the glass go right up into this wooden ceiling here, this kind of board and batten construction having the glass go right into the brick piers, and then at the bottom also having the glass go right into these planters. So there are planters outside of the house and also inside of the house. So these brick piers look almost like passageways in some ways, leading you out into this garden, connecting you with nature in a way that most houses are not designed. It's really, it's fascinating, it's brilliant. And, and the, the attention to detail here is amazing to me because one of the things that he did, look up above here, there are these louvers in, built into the ceiling that modulate the light up above in such a way so that um, it almost looks like the light inside over this garden is like the light filtering down through the trees outside. Um, so he's really kind of breaking the box. That was one of his main goals in architecture so that you know houses aren't just one box after the next. And he's bringing the outdoors in, in such a really smart, wonderful way. Now inside the, the garden room here, if we look back towards the main entrance, we have this view, there's that same long bench we were looking at, the front door is right over here, but we have this massive brick fireplace, not too different from um, the concept that we saw at the glass house, but it's not round. This is a cantilevered fireplace too. Imagine making this huge mass of bricks levitate off the ground. Um, and he's sort of sort of trying to impress other architects with with uh, with an innovation like this because he even includes this concrete cap at the bottom, which sort of is sort of like a lintel that he breaks, uh, emphasizing the fact that this has no structural support uh, whatsoever. You really have to trust the steel inside um, inside uh, the interior of this house. And the Zimmerman certainly did. Look at this, Mrs. Zimmerman just hanging out under that big. Uh, mass of bricks levitating in her living room. And Frank Lloyd Wright had the same uh, very romantic, uh, somewhat antiquated view of how American families should really gather around the fireplace. And, um, and that's how the Zimmermans did use this space. Now, if you look over Mrs. Zimmerman's head, there are these shelves that wrap around the corner. You can see the back of a chair here. This is leading us into what Frank Lloyd Wright called the dining loggia. Now, the dining loggia, uh, loggia is an open air walkway. Frank Lloyd Wright didn't want to waste precious space in this house by giving them a formal dining room. And if you have a formal dining room in your house, it's probably wasted space, right? How often do you use it? You throw your mail on it and then you walk away. So Frank Lloyd Wright thought, I'm going to build this functional house for this couple. So he gave them a tiny dining room table and just a few feet away from it, this is the edge of that same table right here, are all of these doors that have screens inside so you can open them up and feel like you're dining outside for so much of the year. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, what if I have guests? I, my guest is just going to sit here on this ottoman. What if there's more than one of them? Frank Lloyd Wright had a solution for that too. And it is so smart. I want this in my house. First of all, his solution comes out of the fact that he has designed all of the furniture in this house and it's all at the same height. So all of the chairs are roughly 13 feet off or 13 inches, I should say, off of the ground. All of the tables are roughly 
double that 26 inches off the ground. So the spatial, this vertical um, spatial relationship continues on with the shelves, et cetera. But that means that Frank Lloyd Wright designed a dining room table here that has these notches in it. And if the Frank Lloyd Wright, and if the Zimmermans wanted to have a dinner party, they could simply move this table back into the garden room. This hexagonal table here has a split in it. Pull it apart, put your dining room table in the middle, and you can have like 12 people sitting along this banquette or on these little stools here uh, enjoying the view in the garden room. So it's a very flexible design that really works for this, um, this small family here. The kitchen is very utilitarian. He called it the workspace because it also contains the washer and dryer. There is no attic and there is no basement. There's no attic, basement, or garage at the Zimmerman house. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed a house for this middle-aged couple that doesn't have a single step in it. It was a house for them to grow old in, and that's exactly what they did. They lived in this house until their final days. We'll just take a quick peek into their primary bedroom here. Everybody was always so disappointed on tours of this house. I should mention, I gave a lot of tours of this house uh, during my time working at the Courier Museum. So, um, it, people expect, you know, a grand primary bedroom these days, and this is very small scale. The Zimmermans actually slept in just a full size bed. They kept that same um, uh, uh, blanket on on their bed that matched the textiles in the house the entire, you know, three plus decades that they lived there. But it's a wonderful space in terms of the fact that here's that the edge of the bed too. You would go to bed at night. You look up at this beautiful wooden ceiling, and once again. Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uses this illusion of bringing the outdoors in. The glass goes seamlessly up into the ceiling, um, blending the indoors and the outdoors, inviting you into the backyard. Now, the Zimmermans valued their privacy a little bit more than Philip Johnson did. They actually sort of begged Frank Lloyd Wright for some curtains here <laughs> for, um, for uh, you know, privacy in, in, in their house. But when you look at the back of the Zimmerman house, here is that, that primary bedroom. Here's the dining loggia. Here is that, that garden room. You can see that it, I mean, it's lit up like a lantern. It's almost all glass on the back of the house. It reminds me of the way we design modern vacation houses today. They're oriented towards the nicest view. In this case, it's the backyard and it allows for maximum connection to and enjoyment of that beautiful private green space. So you can almost think of the Zimmerman house as like, Philip Johnson's glass house and the guest house sort of smashed together. It's private on the front and it's all open on the back. And in terms of the, the legacy of this house, well, um, it was very influential. Actually, one of Dr. Zimmerman's colleagues, Dr. Khalil, got in touch with Frank Lloyd Wright just a few years later and Wright designed this house for him just four houses down on the same street. This is called a Usonian automatic, automatic because you build it yourself. It was recently acquired by the Courier Museum as well. This is the only, um, I, I think the only uh, museum in the world that owns two Frank Lloyd Wright houses. So you can see them both on any tour. But I will say too, that modest ranch style houses with carports have proliferated. Um, there's plenty of them up here in Manchester, New Hampshire, where I live. And I will tell you that the very house that I'm sitting in right now looks an awful lot like the image over here on the right. So in our time left, we're going to zoom through two academic libraries and take a look at the work of Louis Kahn, who we see here um, in bookend images of the architect. He was born into a poor Jewish family in the Russian empire. He emigrated into uh, America, to America when he was just six years old. And he ended up founding his own uh, architecture firm by the time, by 1935. And he taught architecture at Yale and UPenn. He was another architect who was awarded the AIA Gold Medal. And at the end of his life, he was considered America's foremost living architect. Now, he is best known for buildings like this. He created monumental, monolithic buildings that have this majesty to them, feel like modern day temples. We're looking at um, the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in San Diego. This was designed in 1965. And just to give you a sense of what this building looks like in, in a slightly less romantic lighting, and also from the other perspective, 
you can see that he does have windows in this building, but they're oriented towards that beautiful view. So, um, so Louis Kahn was invited to New Hampshire um, to build a new library on the campus of Phillips Exeter Academy. Now, if you've been to the academy before, it has all of this kind of Georgian revival architecture. The architecture throughout the campus is very consistent, but, um, th but the academy aimed to create a, a strikingly modern building. In fact, that was, that was exactly what the headmaster said he wanted. He wanted the best contemporary architect in the world to design the library. And it was actually Jonas Salk, whose son attended the academy, who called up the headmaster and said, well, Louis Kahn just designed my building and it's great. So we're looking at the library here. It's the largest secondary school library in the world. And it's primarily brick on the outside, a little bit of a nod to the, the, the rest of the academy. And this is load bearing brick here. So there's a little bit of an illusion at the bottom. Uh, I, I mean, th these look like uh, regular um, spaces between each one of these brick piers, but at the bottom, we can see that they're very wide. And by the time they get to the top, they sort of taper off here. Um, Louis Kahn had this wonderful way of describing that taper there. He sort of said it um, it groans at the bottom and it kind of dances at the top. <laughs> we also see a lot of glass. By the time we get to the top, it's, um, it's transparent. There's no glass there. You almost get the sense of like a classical ruin here. Now, um, this building was completed in 1972 at a cost of uh, just under $4 million. That would be about $27 million in today's money. So as we get a little bit closer, we can see the kinds of bricks that he's using here. Louis Kahn famously, he has uh, this whole kind of um, monologue about a brick and what a brick wants to be. But these bricks were locally milled and they're imperfect. They're not those pristine bricks that we saw at the Zimmerman house. There's some teak and there is some glass here. Now, as we look at the bottom floor, it, you, you can't really tell where the front door of this building is. Every side of it looks the same. That was very intentional. He wanted it to seem like you could approach it from any angle. But once you get inside, there are these two grand staircases that you have to use in order to get up to what's really the main floor of the building. There are those staircases over here on the right, and that brings you in to this open atrium where on each side of this atrium, we have a, a massive rectangle here with a square with a circle cut into it. Now, um, these, these shapes here are, they're simple, but they're sort of deceptively simple. They are based on the, the geometric units uh, that that the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius wrote about. Now, I, we all have probably seen uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, drawing of the Vitruvian man, the, the, the human figure that fits inside of these two perfect geometric shapes. So uh, Louis Kahn is sort of unpacking all of that and putting it into his design here. This is um, roughly speaking, also the relationship between these, these geometries is... Um, roughly speaking, the golden ratio. Uh, the uh, uh, When I say that, I mean the height of this rectangle here and, and the, the length of it. So, so he's tapping into these kind of old age uh, uh, or timeless kind of wisdom in terms of proportions. When you look up in the central atrium, there's this heavy, heavy concrete uh, cross hovering above you. It does have some structural purpose, but it's like way bigger than it needs to be. It does help to kind of diffuse a little bit of the light. It also creates the sense that you are in a temple and this is a temple of learning. When we look at a plan of the library, there is that open atrium. It is surrounded by the stacks here. And then on the outer edges where the brick walls are, there are these study carrels of Louis Kahn purposely designed this library to feel like uh, room or like buildings within buildings within buildings. So if we go out to those study carrels that are uh, right against those brick walls, here's what they look like. Um, they have the most amount of light. Louis Kahn always felt like a library starts with the idea of somebody getting a book and moving towards the light to, to read it. So he prioritizes the light for the students. And these are wooden panels that you can actually use to sort of modulate the, the light, almost like you know the panels on, on an airplane in some ways. So here is that relationship between the stacks and the study carols. You find your book and you move towards the light. 
Louis Kahn did something really smart with this building too. The building codes in Exeter, New Hampshire, say you can't build anything taller than four stories. This is a nine story building and he skirted those rules by creating a mezzanine on each of the levels there. So that's how you add up to nine when all was said and done. Now, as, um, as we uh, sort of end our look at Louis Kahn, um, I should mention uh, that that he was an incredibly humble man too. Uh, in terms of this, this very celebrated building, it got the 25 year world, 25 year award from the AIA. He said, I just put a roof over it, which is like the ultimate understatement. So this is really an incredible enduring uh, modern architecture gift that we have here in um, in, New, in New Hampshire, in New England. So even though we're going to go a little bit over time, I wanted to share with you uh, Maya Lynn's new uh, um, library at, at, at Smith College. Now, Maya Lynn is a designer. She's a sculptor. She's a landscape architect. And of course, she achieved international recognition when she was an undergraduate at Yale. And her design for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was selected in a blind competition. Here she is with that design over here. Here she is in a more recent photograph. In 2007, the AIA ranked that memorial as number 10 on America's favorite architecture list, and it's one of the most visited sites on the mall. Maya Lin is a Chinese-American Chinese who was born in Ohio to immigrant parents who were professors at Ohio University. Here's just a glimpse of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which is, of course, a dark V-shaped scar cut into the earth um, listing on these highly polished uh, black granite slabs, the names of more than 50,000 servicemen and women whose lives were lost during the war. This also received the 25 year award from the AIA. And these, you know, the, the experiences that people have, just these two pictures alone show that the experience of this memorial is really unlike anything else in um, in American history. It's deeply personal, it's deeply moving. And um, Maya Lin's memorial just allowed this space to kind of mourn and reflect. So in recent years, she was invited to the campus of Smith College um, to sort of reimagine their library. This is the, uh, the library as it was originally built in the early years of the 1900s. This was a Carnegie library. It's called the Nielsen Library. And over the years, uh, various uh, additions were added to it that sort of expanded from the back of the building, the side in the back of the building, creating like these warrens, these dark warrens in the background, but also taking up a lot of space on campus. Uh, one architecture critic referred to the old library's wings as the architectural equivalent of throwing a beige trench coat over an evening dress. So she had this, um, this assignment, really, this goal in mind of reducing the footprint, but also creating a space that was much more functional. And I should mention that Maya Lin had a profound emotional connection to Smith College. Her mother um, had landed at Smith in 1949 after escaping the communist invasion in Shanghai. And when she left, she left in a boat with nothing but like $10 to her name. And her... <laughs> excuse me, Smith College acceptance letter sewn into her clothes. So without Smith College, really Maya Lin wouldn't be there. So how does Maya Lin handle honoring this kind of architectural history, but also creating something new? Well, she kind of tore it down to its studs. <laughs> the expansions are gone here. And we can see that original building um, with essentially, it, it's been gutted here, but that shell remains intact in part because Maya Lin knows as, as much as anybody else that we are attached to places, we are attached to history. And so you have to preserve some of that and keep that intact. So the end result here is, um, is that Carnegie Library that still stands reimagined inside, and then these um, these new wings added on other side, now, on on either side, and there are there's really gendered language around these wings. It's it's so fascinating to me, because and I and I'm not sure if the the gendered language comes from Smith College or comes from Maya Lin or the other architectural form, firm that was involved, but they talk about these these wings as being swaddled in lime in lime stone. I've never heard of anything being swaddled in limestone. They also talk about them as being like little jewel boxes. And 
to me, there's nothing jewel box like about them. But these are terms that I think are, are very appealing to the specific audiences in mind here. So the end result is a $120 million project, and it offered 151,000 square feet of new space at the library. Now, um, let's let's just quickly peek at the materials here. We've got the, the original brick and then a lot of glass, that limestone and, and some metal here. Uh, she set the new wings a little bit further back. And like I said, they, they take up less of a footprint on this Frederick Law Olmsted design campus. So it gives it a little bit of room to breathe. And that's sort of the idea inside as well. There's a lot more space. This was also designed in the, in the midst of the pandemic. So big open spaces, big uh, flexible spaces here as well. You notice that there is this um, vertical kind of corridor here. This is a light well that stretches from the top of the original building down to the basement, sort of letting light travel down here. Um, it's a 70 foot 74 foot long sun dial essentially here's the basement you can see how lit up it is so it uh, just has light literally pouring in you might be thinking okay there's all this flexible space where are the books the books are in the basement <laughs> a lot of the books are in the basement and they are housed in a smarter way these are compactable stacks um, also taking advantage of the um, the support of the ground in this case too so those, those wings that she added on either side, they're not identical to each other, but I wanted to show you the inside of one of them here. This one has this big, beautiful atrium when you walk in. There's, um, it's not like the uh, sort of humbling atrium that, that Louis Kahn designed. This is sort of fun and inviting. Notice uh, the, the furniture too. It's cozy, it's bright, it's comfortable, it's accessible. There's still plenty of light for you to be drawn to over here. It's not just about the study carols anymore. Although there are some here. I was, you know, after thinking about Louis Kahn for so long, I was stunned to see the, the study carols sort of pushed away from the light. But if you think about it, these are spaces where people open up their laptops and that's where the light's coming from. Just outside these windows, you can see there's a sunken garden here that was dedicated to Maya Lin's mother. So we still sort of have the sense of, of a memorial of honoring the past here. And outside the other wing of the, of the new library, there is a built-in amphitheater as well. So, um, so really sort of wonderful relationship to the landscape in so many ways. Now, the Nielsen Library reopened in 2021, like I said, about a year into the pandemic. And a lot of the stories about this new library were overshadowed, not just by the coronavirus, but by the fact that Maya Lin suddenly lost her husband to a heart attack about six months before the library reopened. Now, Maya Lin doesn't design memorials anymore. But I think architecture critics sort of wanted to frame this as a memorial in some way because of the, the architect's auspicious beginnings. So Maya Lin's story isn't over. She's still being recognized for her creative accomplishment, accomplishments. She has won all of the awards you could ever imagine. And there's still certainly more to come from her. So very quickly to conclude, just a couple of big ideas. And I love these comparisons, these different ways that um, these architects have approached the same problem. Some of these buildings that we saw today were designed to connect um, the, the inhabitants to nature outside, but they did so using a variety of materials and means. Some of these buildings were designed to maximize light or to use it to really dramatic effect. I love this beam of light shooting down through the atrium. And then we have this final notion that, that we've seen architects using unusual materials and forms throughout. So modern architects in New England have not just broken the mold when it comes to the history of architecture, they've set a new standard for revolutionary practices and design worldwide right here in New England. So we have a lot to be proud of and a lot of destinations in mind over the next few months. I will end there for now, and I welcome any questions or comments you might have about the buildings we looked at or the architects we discussed. Start looking through some of the chat here. 
Um, Jean says, I visited Philip Johnson's glass house in the 1970s at his invitation. How cool. I was an architecture uh, class at Yale given by Vincent Scully. A lot of the architects are, our architects spoke in class, including Johnson. That is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. The guest house for the glass house is underground in the side of a hill. Very cool. Um, uh, she, oh, she meant the artwork was underground. Okay. The pond had a kind of Japanese installation too. Yes, there's all these different structures on on um, on the property. We didn't have the time to get to all of it, but it's if it's something that sort of piques your interest, I definitely recommend visiting. Or I'm sure there's some great websites out there too. But Jean, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I gotta know was Andy Warhol there too? So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Rosamond says, oh, thank you, Rosamond, for your kind words. You too, Jean. I really appreciate it. Um, how many houses did Frank Lloyd Wright design? I used to know this off the top of my head. I think it's somewhere around 400. That might be buildings total, not just houses. Um, but I could be totally off. I, it, actually, he designed probably a thousand plus, and I think about 400 of them were built. Don't quote me on that. L look that up online. <laughs> um, Nancy, thank you for your kind words. Jean, sorry you didn't get a chance to meet Andy Warhol. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for these nice comments. I'm going to the Q&A now. Um, Jack says, what was the glass house like at night? Did he dim, did he dim the glass? dim the lights, I'm guessing you mean. Um, that's a really good question. And it's interesting. There aren't a lot of readily available images about uh, of the, the glass house at night. Um, but it, I, I could imagine that it could kind of glow a little bit lantern-like, like some of these buildings that we saw before. But it, does, it doesn't seem to have a really ambitious sort of lighting display in there either. So I think it would have been uh, a little bit more intimate. And now I have to look up one of the, a, a good image of the glass house at night. Thank you for adding that. But I mean, it obviously you could see inside much easier than you could see outside. So uh, I think... Um, Philip Johnson had to handle a lot of people sneaking around trying to get a glimpse at him. He actually had to hire security so that people wouldn't do that. Rosamond asked, was the glass house made with triple glazed glass? How did it stay warm? I think there were a lot of issues with the heating and the cooling of the glass house. Probably one of the reasons why Philip Johnson didn't live there um, all the time, in addition to the privacy concerns. I'm not sure. I I'm not sure if it was triple glazed. I don't know, Jean, if, if Jean remembers that, maybe you could speak to it. Um, but I do know that it got very hot on, on sunny days. So that was a, a real problem there. So we have Gropius on the one hand, who's like designing everything to keep things cool, keep things warm. And then the glass house kind of ignores that in its design. Um, Rosamond asks, in the Gropius house, is the floor in the entrance hall made from cork? It is indeed made from cork. We can sort of zoom over there real quickly, just to get a, a peek at it. And I know that um, the cork was sort of in rough shape when um, historic New England took over the house. So I think they redid some of the, those cork panels on the ground, but um, it makes for a really soft entryway too. Jeff, thanks for your kind words. I appreciate that. Uh, Mary asked, did the Gropius family have a maid? A really good question. I can't remember offhand. Um, if they did, I don't think it was a live-in maid. Uh, I know that they had a guest room and people like frequently came and stayed at the house, but I'm not sure if they had any live-in help. I know that the Zimmermans wrote to the wrote to Frank Lloyd Wright and said good help was hard to find in Manchester, New Hampshire. So I'm sure that was a continuing thread throughout the 20th century. Um, so uh, so I, I'm not I'm not totally sure, but if they had help, I, I don't think it was live-in help. Um, all right. I think we got through everything here. Great questions. Thank you, everybody, for staying a little bit late with me. Thank you, Gianna. Thank you so much, Jane. This was a great presentation as usual. Um, and thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight. Just a quick update. We do have two pretty big programs coming up tomorrow. We have our monthly book brunch. So please join us for that. It's hybrid. So you can join online if you want, learn about some new books that you might want to read. We also have a Zoom online visit with the one book Chelmsford author, um, Charlotte McConaughey. And uh, so 
come and hear the author talk um, should be fun and exciting. Um, also future art on Thursdays programs to note. So next month in June, we have um, Art on Thursdays presents George Tooker, Modern Life and Magical Realism. And then in July, we have Norman Rockwell on art. So please come the next couple of months and join us for those programs. And everyone be on the lookout in your emails for a recording of tonight's presentation as well within the next couple of days. All right, everybody with that, have a good night. And thanks again for joining us. And thank you again, Jane. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Right. Good night. Night, everybody.